Take out your Bible. We're going to read God's Word. We are in part eight of a series we have called Battle Ready. Battle Ready. Let me just ask you, if you love the series, you're learning a lot from the series. Yeah. Hope you're getting a lot out of it. I was with some of my North Tampa crew, by the way, last week up there getting my hair cut. And there's a bunch of people in the barber shop that all uh, go to Radiant. And so they asked me, I, they, they said, oh, are you preaching this week on Battle Ready? I said, yeah. They're like, oh, this series has been long. And uh, then they just paused. It's like, and? and they're, oh, no, no, it's been very helpful. It's been good. I'm like, well, say that first, okay? <laughs> Anyway, next week's the finale, but uh, uh, I hope that you'll learn a lot. Let's read God's word and then we'll be seated. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 13, it says it like this, Therefore, put on the full armor of God. Don't, don't go halfway into this thing. Go all the way in. Why? Because when the day of evil comes, and some of y'all are in that day of evil, you feel that attack against your family, against your friends, against your mind, against your emotions. When that day of evil comes, you are able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything, you're going to be able to stand. I just want you to know that. And stand firmly then. With, then it tells us the belt of truth. Man, you've got to be surrounded by truth. Buckled around your waist. With that breastplate of righteousness in place. You need that righteousness. And with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes through the gospel of peace. Peace should be a part of your life. And then it says, in addition to all of this, take up that shield of faith we talked about last Sunday with which you can extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one. And then the last two, ready? Take up the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. This week, we're gonna talk today for a few minutes about the helmet of salvation, the helmet of salvation. Jesus, speak to us today. Let us be forever transformed. Even as you're sitting there right now, just take your hands, do, do me a favor. Everybody, even a guest, put it right over your mind like this. Lord, there's a lot of us that have been dealing with attacks in our minds. We need, we need a helmet of salvation. Lord, our minds need to be transformed from dirty thoughts and nasty thoughts and old ways of thinking. Lord, that we'll leave here in just a few minutes totally transformed. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody that believes it says, amen, amen. amen. You can be seated. You can be seated. The helmet of salvation. Helmets have been kind of a normal part of culture for thousands of years, no matter how far you go back. Helmets are part of it. I don't know about you, but for some reason, when you look at the history of helmets, you got 2,000 years at least of helmets being used, except for about 10 years in what's a time period called the 1980s. I don't know if y'all were <laughs> raised in the 1980s. Uh, any 80s kids out there know how, man, uh, you, you were never required to put on a helmet like my kids are put on helmets today. But uh, the helmet is so crucial, it protects one of the most crucial parts of your body, the, the brain. And helmets come in all shapes and sizes. So we got a little motorcycle helmet here. Um, if you're wearing a motorcycle, please, I'm your pastor. I love you enough to tell you, wear a helmet. Uh, you're wearing a bicycle, man, wear a helmet uh, right there. We got a little bicycle helmet. Uh, we got a construction helmet. I, I, don't, I don't know much about this, you know, but I know that they're, they're necessary. You need to wear this if you're in construction world. And then you got your, your army or your military helmet. I mean, this thing is super heavy. This can take a bullet right here. Uh, I was going to have four people on the stage come up and wear these and then play the YMCA. Wouldn't that have been perfect? <laughs> yes, there's copyright laws and stuff like that. But, but helmets come in all shapes and sizes. But the thing is, the helmet that's mentioned in our passage today was from the Apostle Paul looking at a Roman soldier. And as he's looking at the Roman soldier, he is giving what is, he's looking at this Roman helmet. And we actually have one, which I think is pretty cool from, from that time period. This is what the helmet looked light and it had a very distinct look for the Roman world that day that was a reason that Paul described it as a helmet of salvation because it provided two things I want you to write it down in your notes the helmet provided first of all it provided identity you see this kind of red mohawk over the top here so people look at what that's for like you can sweep your floor with it which is awesome but that's not the reason the reason these are worn is because it identified who they are. Like this is no, they're, they're Roman soldiers. And actually based on the look of it, it also identified what rank they were, what area they fought in. So this was, it was a distinct mark of who the Roman soldier was, but it also provided safety for the, for the brain, because obviously you know that if you, you, know, you get hit in the head, it's all over. There needs to be safety that goes over the brain. So both of these were necessary, and you needed identity, and you needed safety. Let's say those two words. You need identity, and you need safety. One more time, identity and safety. And he says, what would it be 
for the, the believer when they're in the middle of spiritual warfare that would provide them with identity and safety in their battle. And he said this word, and the word was salvation. Salvation would be the thing. So the belt is a belt of truth. The breastplate has righteousness. The, sh the shoes are, are peace. We understand the shield is faith. And if you're gonna go to the helmet that provides identity and safety, then what do we need? We need salvation. Here's salvation, it's not in your notes. It's God's life-changing power to transform. Let me say it again. Salvation is God's life-changing power to transform. This is what that means. It means that, listen, you don't have to stay the way you are. That's good news for you today. I want you to know it's God's power that transforms us and he can transform your life. I'm glad we're not here to just do church or here to just sing some songs. We are in the life transforming business and I don't know about you, God has changed my life. Is there anybody else that God has changed their life? He's in the business of saving people. But what you have to understand is when you put on salvation, here's what it does. It provides the Christian soldier with identity and their safety in Christ. Now, why is this important? Because Paul would have been writing to Christians. And he would say, listen, by the time we get to this last, the second to last piece of armor, I, I hope you're already a believer. So he's, he's assuming that you already have initial salvation. But what I want to present to you today is there's salvation available after your salvation. Now, that might be confusing. You're like, I don't even know if I have the first one. Well, we're going to make sure you got it today. And I, I want you to know this. Listen, the additional salvation is impossible without the initial salvation. So if you have never given your life to Christ, if you are not born again, if you don't have that relationship with God, I want you to know this today. You've not messed up too much. You have not sinned too much. You're not too far gone. God's grace is still saving people's life and he can save your life today. Come on, give them better praise than that. Amen, church? But you have to understand how salvation works. Now, I showed you this picture a couple weeks ago when it shows the way that people are made. We are complex beings. Some of y'all are sitting next to someone. You're going, Aaron, you have no clue how complex they are. I, I know. You, you'll learn. It's, it's crazy. So we're all complex beings, and we're made up of three parts, okay? We're triune in nature because we're made in the image of God. So in the same way, we're made of three different parts. I want to show them to you. They're right there is your spirit. That's, that's, the, that's who you are on the inside of you. Then you have your soul, which is your mind. And then you have your body, which is your flesh. It's the things that you do. So I told you a few weeks ago, every single one of these is affected different by salvation. So when you get saved, when you put your faith in Jesus, I want you to know what is immediately transformed is that spirit inside of you. So here's the problem is a lot of you guys, you leave a service and you have the same temptations you had before the service. And you go, well, I raised my hand. I guess nothing happened. And you didn't realize that the salvation that happened in your spirit now has to translate to a salvation in your soul and then in your body. But a lot of people stop short and go, well, I put my trust in God. That's it. And you've let it stop affecting who you are. So let me just remind you, God loves you the way you are but he also loves you way too much to keep you that way. Amen. So he wants to transform you. And how does it start? It starts with spirit transformation. And from there, there needs to be a salvation that follows of your mind and then of your body. A lot of you guys can't control your body because your mind is so unsaved. It's all messed up. You're thinking ways that you've been thinking for 20 or 30 years, but now you're at church and you're going, why isn't it changing? Because you need a salvation in your mind. Write it on your notes this way. Salvation of our spirit is automatic. It's something that happens immediately when you give your life to Christ. But salvation of our soul, our mind, our will, our emotions, that's going to take a little bit of work. So I'm going to challenge you for a little bit today to put a little work into it, to make sure you're working this stuff out in your life. That's why Paul says it this way, very controversial passage. But he says, my dear friends, as you've always obeyed, not only in my presence, but also in my absence, continue to work. Now, people don't like that phrase. They don't like the idea of like working things out. No, no, he says, work it out, your salvation with fear and trembling. Now, is he talking about salvation of your spirit? There's no way. Because that salvation is received solely by grace through faith. 
So there's no way you can work it out to where you get more saved in your spirit. Let me just remind you, once you give your life to Christ, you're never more saved or less saved than at that moment. That's good news. We have security in Christ. But what is he talking about? Let that salvation of your spirit affect the rest of you. So your mind needs to get saved. It's like the children of Israel. They were for 400 years in Egypt, and then they get delivered. How many know you can get out of Egypt, but Egypt is still in you? Yeah. And some of y'all have experienced that. Let me put it a little more, more uh, relevant. You can get out of Ebor, but Ebor's still <laughs> South Howard's maybe a little still in you. You know what I mean? <laughs> That's funny. There's some things that need to be worked out in our life. And so what do we do about that? We realize there needs to be a helmet of salvation that goes into our mind that changes us. Here's why. Because where the mind goes, the man always follows. So if you want to control your flesh, you've got to first control your mind. So some of you guys, you don't understand. Your battle's not really in your flesh. Your battle's in what you're thinking. And here's what I call it. I call it stinking thinking. That's just an Aaron Burke original right there. Some of y'all got some stinking thinking. I mean, if we smelled it, we're like, ooh, you've been thinking that? It's phrases like, I'm never going to be good enough. I'm, not, I'm never going to beat this thing. I'm never going to find a spouse. I'm never going to get better. I'm never going to have a healthy relationship. I, I catch myself all the time in stinking thinking, and it'll creep up in all of us. Let me tell you, I've been following the Lord for a long time, and it still comes into my mind. Just the other day, I was traveling to Dallas to preach to a bunch of pastors, huge opportunity. So I flew out on a Monday morning, I go to Dallas and, and we get right to the airport. I mean, I'm right on time, I'm supposed to land, get in a car, speak at a lunch to a bunch of senior pastors and then I'll preach the general session in front of everybody about one o'clock and then I'll preach the night session at seven o'clock. We go to land and the pilot gets over the intercom and is like, well, ladies and gentlemen, we got a little bit of a problem and uh, we're gonna circle the airport a little bit and because uh, there's some storms on the ground. I say, well, I don't care if there's storms on the ground. You land this plane. <laughs> <laughs> you just do that. Like, so I don't know about you. Like, there's some people that just look at it and they're like, oh, okay. I'll relax. I'll read a book. Some me time. Not Aaron Burke. No, no, no. No, I'm sitting there. I, again, I don't know if it's a personality thing. I'm opening the windshield. I'm looking out my window the entire time going, okay, are we circling again? Are we circling? What is, what's the, hey, stewardess, what's the plan right now? Like, are we doing this? And then this stinking thinking starts popping up. Like, well, well, maybe they can drop me off because everybody else in this plane can miss their stuff. But I can't miss, like, uh, they, do they know who I am? Like, do, do they, like, this is, this is what happens. You get in this in your mind. And he goes over a few minutes later. Like, well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we're running out of fuel. So uh, <laughs> might circle this a little bit longer, but if not, we're going to have to come up with another plan. Yes, you are. You better come up with another plan. You, we pay you to come up with quick plans like that. You ain't running out of fuel with me. I got five kids. My wife will come after you. <laughs> you take, <laughs> so, so then he comes over the intercom a few minutes later. Hey, just want everybody to know we're heading to Austin. I'm like, well, ma'am, Austin wasn't our destination. Like, I, I don't know what's in Austin for you guys, but my, my dest- I get there. I'm telling you, I'm a saint. I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. But boy, was that stinking thinking going. These incompetent people, how dare they? Like, I'm sitting there trying to figure out, it's going on in my mind. And then I have to call the pastor. Hey, I, and I'm sitting there going, man, this guy's going to get on the phone and he's just going to be so mad. He's going to be, I call him, hey, I just want you to know, we had to land in Austin. I don't know when I'm going to be there. Oh, Aaron, it's no problem. It's no problem. You come whenever you can. Well, this guy doesn't even appreciate me. I don't even, I don't even know why he invited me to speak in the first place. <laughs> We land, we're five hours late. They move my session around. I drive. It was all crap. It comes in all of our minds. And what do we do? It, it, it starts in our mind and then works ourselves out in the rest of our life. That's why the Bible says it this way. For as he thinks in his heart, so is he. So if you're angry with your actions, realize it's not an actions problem. It's a thought problem. Because it always starts up here. So what do we do with all of this stinking thinking in our life? Here's what I've learned to do is we got to put it into practice what the scriptures tell us. This is, this is your practical application, right? Here's what Paul tells us to do. So we take captive every thought and we make it obedient to Christ. Now, I don't know if you have a two-year-old. But when my two-year-old does not behave correctly, I don't go, well, just do whatever you want. We're in, you know, the store, and they're just pulling things off the shelf. Well, 
Let it go. Just do whatever you want. I'm not that parent. When my two-year-old is out of control, I take captive <laughs> my two-year-old and I make it obedient to the situation that I'm in. And the same way, parents, believers, people here today understand this. As a Christian, not every thought should stay in your mind. Well, it's in there. I'm just going to let it run rampant. No, 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 no. When the thought comes into your mind, you recognize it. And like that two-year-old, you take it captive and you say, not in my house do we obey this way. Not in my house do we think this way. I am making this thought obedient to Christ. He is the Lord of my life. And I'm going to do it his way instead of the world's way. Come on, that's better preaching. But I get it. I get the idea. And here's why it's important. Here's why it's important. Because your life will always follow the directions of your your strongest thoughts. So if you're sitting there and you're going, I don't like the direction I'm going, you need to start taking captive some thoughts. And for me, those thoughts, by the way, that I most often had to take captive is when I start complaining about the things that were a blessing in my life years ago. Isn't that how it works in our life? That a lot of times the very things that were answers to prayer in the last season are the things you're complaining about in this season. Well, this job, nobody appreciates me. Well, that was a job that you prayed in God. Well, that spouse, I can't believe that. That was an answer to prayer in 21 days of prayer and fasting. That child, man, I, I just, I can't believe these kids are driving me nuts. The very kids you pleaded with God to give you. And what do we have to do? When those thoughts come in, when things that are a blessing become a burden, and that thought in your mind gets in there, you take captive the thought, you make it obedient to Christ, and you say, listen, just because you came into my mind doesn't mean you're staying there. You now have been given an eviction order, and because you are not what God is thinking, I'm not going to let it be in my mind any longer. I'm taking control over my thoughts. Get a helmet of salvation on. Amen. Watch it redeem you from your mind and let it affect the rest of your body. That's why Paul says, do not conform to the pattern of this world. But be transformed. How are we transformed? He tells us. By the renewing of our mind. We're going to let God transform the way we think. So then, by the way, you will be able to test and approve what God's will is and not just any of his will his good his pleasing and his perfect will do you want to know god's perfect will how do you start it starts with the mind let it transform the way you think so let me help you with this let me help you put on the helmet of salvation today and this is something i try to do very often here's the two things that i want to challenge you with is first of all you need to think different about who you are think different about who you are here's why Because remember the helmet of salvation, the helmet that the Roman soldiers wore, first of all, what was it about? It was about identity. It was about establishing our identity. And what is the enemy's attack over your life? It's always your identity. It's it's, it's your alone. You're by yourself. You're, you're, You're not a child of God. No, 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 no. You have to establish your identity. Because here's why. The enemy will always try to confuse who you are because if he can confuse who you are, then he's always got you confused of what you're called to do. And it always starts with who you are. So we transform, we put on the helmet of salvation by understanding our identity. That is why parents, can I just be very brutal and honest with you today? The most important thing you're doing when you're raising children is not raising them up to be smart. You're raising them up to understand their identity in Christ. Because the world is working overtime at establishing an identity that you don't want your child to have. But God's word is very clear about who they are. So we're not going to let their identity be based on culture or even based on what their body thinks they or who they are. Why? Because the body is only a reaction to the mind, and the mind is the first affected by the spirit, and we understand we are not who culture says we are. I'm not even who I feel like I am. I am who God says that I am. I'm holding on to that no matter what, and I'm going to establish it in my children. I'm going to speak it over them. I'm going to reinforce it in them because all of us are giving these labels in our life by culture and by friends and by our upbringing. And here's what happens. Our labels end up limiting us. 
So I remember growing up and I was the class clown. Oh, Aaron, you're so funny. Like, Aaron, you're, you're, you make us laugh. Aaron, tell us a joke. And I was like, oh, like that was my life from like mid- elementary, middle school. When I get saved and I was in high school and I would get called into ministry, like I would call, called to preach. And I remember getting called to preach and I've shared this before. Man, I had an opportunity to preach in front of my whole school. I put my name in the hat. They would go, one person from your class is gonna be able to preach. I was like, this is my opportunity. Put that name in the hat and I'll never forget them pulling out that name and they go, Aaron, 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 you want, are you wanting to tell some jokes? Like you want to make people laugh? What? Because that had become my identity. I want to remind you, you're, listen, this is so important for us because some of you guys, you've put a label, you've put an identity on your life and it's limited who God's called you to be. This is, by the way, this is not a new thing. But in the scriptures, you see it all the time. You see people who were built up and identified by their, their issue. You have a, a woman that's known as a woman with the issue of blood. So everywhere they go, it's like, there's the woman with the issue of blood. Can you imagine that being your identity? You have blind Bartimaeus. Every time people introduce him, there's the guy that can't see. There's blind Bartimaeus. It's not just Bartimaeus that is blind. No, no, his name is blind Bartimaeus. You have a guy in scripture who's called the demoniac. All right, demoniac, what does that mean? He had, he had a demon. Can you imagine Uncle Demoniac? Like, <laughs> like, hey, this is the guy. Like, hey, hey, kids, this is Uncle Demoniac. You're not allowed to be alone with him at all. Like, he's creepy, okay? We all have one, right? Like, and what was it? It was the culture to constantly identify people by their issue. But Jesus changed the game, and I want you to know he can change the game for your life also. There was a guy by the name of uh, uh, one of the great disciples named Peter. He established the church. He ended up being one of the greatest history makers in the planet. But his original name was not Peter. It was a name Simon. And Simon actually in the Greek means snub-nosed. In other words, people, some theologians believe it actually means he had a deformed nose that was, that was his identity. So you have a guy who as a baby was, was looked at and go, ooh, I guess this is our snub nose baby. Can you imagine if you name your kids by what they look like as children? My, all, all my kids would look, I mean, they're beautiful now, but back then, like just creatures, you know, like he was like, we think they're cute, but you know what I mean? Like... And all, <laughs> every single year, there, there's the guy with the messed up nose. There's the guy with the messed up nose. There's, and Jesus comes along and says, no, 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 no. That's not how I'm in the name of you. And he says, listen, no, no, no. You, you're Simon. You are Simon. That's what everybody calls you, son of John. But you shall be called. And he says, Cephas, which is actually translated as Peter. And what means actually is rock. In other words, you're gonna be you're gonna be stronger than you think you are. You're gonna be greater. There's gonna be something that's established in your life that's bigger than you think you are. Let me tell some people here today that have some issues that have defined their life. Jesus came on the scene, and here's what happened. Therefore, if anybody that is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, the new is here. So I don't know what you've been called in the past, but God's got a new name for you, and he's still in the business of transforming our identities so write it down your notes this way ready my issue is not my identity it's not and I don't know what it is if it's divorced Dan or or bankrupt Bob or you know uh, there's a lot of them you got the idea don't let it define you because that's not what the way God sees you and you need to establish in that helmet of salvation who you are can I say it this way failure is an event it is not a person So I don't know who it needs to hear this today, but you need your mind transformed that you are a new creation in Christ Jesus. You want to put on the helmet of salvation? Remind yourself daily, no, I know who I am. I am chosen. I am appointed. I am redeemed. I am called. I am transformed. I am an overcomer. I am a victor. I am healed. I am prepared. I am gifted and I am forgiven. And by the way, I'm just getting started. Can I hear a good amen. That's who we are in Christ. Number two, and we'll close with, out with this one because it didn't just provide identity, it also provided us with safety. And what are we doing? We're having safety over our minds. What does bring safety over our minds? Here's what it is, is we think different about what we do. So now it's not just who we are, it's now what we do. Because a lot of you guys are doing things and you keep getting yourself in bad situations. And the problem is, is you don't think different than the way the world does. 
So you got to change the way you think. And this is what the scriptures do. The scriptures are always countercultural. They're always going to transform what we think is right and make it to go, no, 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 I'm going to do it different than everybody else. Because let me just say, there's a wrong way to do things. For instance, toilet paper. Can I just give you some examples? So let me just show you this. There's a wrong way to do this. So I don't know who you people are that need deliverance that do it the way the bottom is done. Okay. It's not correct. It's, it's not okay. It, it's, it's wrong. And at Radiant Church, our standard is the top up there. Can I hear a good amen today, church? <laughs> There's a wrong way to cut a sandwich. I just want you to know that I'm just, I'm not trying to stir controversy, but again, again, if you're one of those weird people that cut it like the bottom down here, you're just, you need some help. Okay. There's a group available from you. You cut it di- diagonal. That's what you do for a sandwich. You get the better experience. I know you might want to argue with me, but I have the stage. I have the microphone and I'm right. <laughs> Yeah, let me tell you, I, I love pizza. I'm a big pizza person, but there's a wrong way to do pizza. If you put pineapple on pizza, it's wrong. And I'm just going to set the standard at every location today that Radiant Church, we're not pineapple pizza, people. Now, now <laughs> I thought there'd be more cheers, but this obviously is a very touchy subject today at <laughs> church. But there is a way, if you're going to eat pineapple pizza, there is a way to eat it that I think is, a, is healthy. How do you eat pizza with pineapples on it? And you throw it right there in the trash. That's how you eat it right there. <laughs> You got to realize that there's a way that you have to think that is contrary to the world. And let me just say this, ready? God is not trying to control you. He's trying to free you. So if you're upset, you're going, well, I don't want to do it God's way. He's not trying to control you. He's trying to free you. So a fish isn't controlled by being in the ocean. Well, I wish I was on the land. No, 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 no. You swim best when you're in the ocean. The train isn't controlled by the tracks. The train goes the best when it's on the tracks. It's, it's not a control thing. It's a freeing thing. He wants you to be all that he, he's called you to be. Your marriage. Let me tell you, the reason he put boundaries, the reason he put stuff in dating, why? It's not to control you. It's to free you. He has a way of doing things that are different the way we do. So we have to start with our mind. So let me close with this. Ephesians 4. He says, finally, brothers, whatever is true. Well, let's pause there for a second. What's the opposite of true? It's things that are false. So if they're in our mind and they're false things and they're you know, there's stuff like that. I'm, I'm not going to take control over them. I'm going to cast them down. I'm only going to think about things that are true. And then what is noble? What, what's the opposite of noble? Noble, sleazy. It's just things that are like dirty. No, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to think about noble things. Whatever is right. So what is the opposite? Things that are wrong. I'm not going to think about things that are wrong. I'm going to think about what's right. Whatever is pure. Well, what's the opposite of that? I'm, and that's, this is going to be this world. I'm not going to sit there and meditate on things that are trashy. No, no, no. I'm thinking on pure things. Whatever's lovely. What's the opposite of lovely? Things that are hate-filled. Oh, no, I'm not going to be part of that. My mind is only with things that are lovely. Admirable. Oh, no, it's full of honor. Well, what's the opposite of admirable? Well, it's dishonoring culture. No, no, no. We're not going to be those people. We're going to think right about each other. Oh, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, what's the opposite of praiseworthy? Gossip slander, tearing people down. No, 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 not in my mind. In my mind, if it's not what God wants it to be, I'm going to take those things captive and I'm going to make it obedient to Christ. And here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to think about such things. And here's the response, ready? And the God of peace. You want peace in your body? It starts with you thinking the right way in your mind. So you got to do it God's way. You got to do it God's way. So here's the good news, ready? It can be transformed. Your mind can be transformed. First Corinthians 2. For who has known the mind of the Lord as to instruct him? And then he says it like this, but we have the mind of Christ. In other words, we have the ability to tap into the mind of Christ. So let me give you some mindset ch- changes that you can write down in your notes but that are contrary to the way we actually believe. And let me give you this first. The first one is simply this, is that I'm just not going to live for self. This is a mindset shift. Now, this is, might be different than some of y'all. Some of y'all are like, well, it's about me. Well, it shouldn't be. I'm going to change mine. Instead, I'm going to serve. I'm going to living for, to serve. Amen. I'm making it about other people. I'm, I'm not living to hold grudges. I'm not going to hold grudges. No, 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 no. That's, I know, I know everybody says I deserve to be mad. I'm not going to be mad. I'm not going to hold grudges. My mind is changed because I'm going to forgive quickly. Amen. I'm going to forgive quickly. Why? Because I have the mind of Christ. And anytime that grudge tries to come into my mind, I'm taking it captive. I'm making it obedient to Christ. I'm not managing my sin. 
I'm not sitting there going, okay, I'm going to live one way on Friday night, another way on Sunday, and, and this way in front of this group, and this way in front of this group. No, no, not in that sin management. No, no, I'm going to live freely. I'm going to, live, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to experience total walking in freedom. Why? Because this is what God's called us to do. No, 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 I'm being who God's called me to be. I, I just think you have to fight this stuff in your mind. Make it clear. This is how I'm going to think. Yes. I'm, I'm not alone. It's a mindset shift. I'm not alone. No, no, no. I am a vital part of the family of God. Amen. Don't let that enemy lie to you that you're alone, that you're, you're pointless, you're by yourself. No, 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 not here. You're a vital part of the family of God. I'm not looking at people as my problem. Your landlord's not your problem. Your boss is not your problem. Your neighbor's not your problem. Your family's not your problem. No, no, people are my purpose. Do you see that mindset shift right there? We just have to, you have to change it. No, 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 that's not my problem. That's my purpose. I'm the people business. And here, and here one more. Ready, ready? I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to give up. As easy as it would be to give up, I'm not going to do it. Because here's my mindset shift. Ready? It's I'm just getting started. I'm just getting started. And a lot of you guys, you need freedom over your mind today. Because you've let these thoughts go run free in your mind. And it's time today to take them captive and make them obedient to Christ. When people are training a circus elephant, um, if you are under 30, I want you to know, we used to go to these events called circuses <laughs> with live animals. It was awesome. So when you would go to these, these, these circuses, they have these elephants. And elephants are thousands of pounds, one of the strongest creatures on the planet, but when you would go to them as a baby, what they would do to train them is they would take the baby elephant and they would tie it to a stake in the ground. And that stake would hold, would be strong enough to hold that baby elephant. So that baby elephant would go and, oh, it would stop. It would go and it would stop because the stake would hold it down. But as the elephant grew larger and grew stronger, the stake never changed. Why? Because the elephant really didn't have a strength problem, it had a thought problem. So what happened is, is as the elephant grew stronger, it could easily overpower that stake, but it didn't. Why? Because the battle was always in the elephant's mind. The elephant thought the thing that held it back would always hold it back. Can I encourage some people around Tampa Bay today that are watching Radiant Church? You are stronger than you were a year ago. You're stronger than you were five years ago. That spirit that's been transformed is transforming your body, is transforming your soul, and you can walk in victory. It's time for us to get up and make a decision and say, you know what? I'm not letting that stake hold me back any longer. That addiction's not going to hold me back any longer. That mindset's not going to hold me, hold me back any longer. I am finding freedom in my mind to walk in victory with the mind of Christ. Can I hear a better amen today across Tampa Bay? So stand your feet across Tampa Bay. Oh, I've left a few minutes at the end of the service. Nobody moving around. I'm so excited about this moment right here because I believe so many people are going to find freedom in their mind. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to have a moment together to get some mind renewed, to put on the helmet of salvation. Some of you guys, it's your identity has been attacked. You've been called all the failures, all your issues, all your mistakes. And now today, we're establishing your identity in Christ. There's others of you, you've just been acting the wrong way. You're going to change the way you think about some stuff. So we're going to start it right here in this moment. We're not going to do it by our own strength. We can't do it ourselves. We're going to let the Spirit of God who saved our spirit now transform our mind. So let's do this together. We started the service with it. We're going to end with it right now. Take your hands. Let's put it over your mind right here. We take right now authority of every thought that has been running through the mind of Radiant Church. Lord, people who have thought that they are insufficient, that their best days are behind them, that they will always deal with the anxiety, that they'll always deal with the worry, that they'll never have a healthy relationship, that they'll never succeed. I rebuke those thoughts and I cast them down. We make them obedient to Christ. And we thank you, God, even right now. We speak your identity. They are children of God. They are forgiven. They are whole. They are righteous in the sight of God. They are transformed and being transformed daily. We will not walk in the patterns of this world. We will be transformed by the renewing of our mind. And even as we worship, we get our mind on you and let you change.
transform us from the inside out. In Jesus' name we pray. Come on, let's worship at every location. Let's make it an anthem today. Sing it out. Come on. Come on, sing it out. An almighty fortress. Come on. An almighty fortress. You go before. because I'm doing life his way instead of the world's way. And watch how you'll walk in victory in every area of your life. One last group that's here today. And if we're gonna talk about salvation, it's people that don't have a relationship with God. I want you to know you can, you haven't messed up too much. You haven't gone too far for you to experience salvation in Christ. I want you to know how to use it start. It starts by you making a simple yet significant decision to turn control of your life to Christ. Your, your flesh, your body, might not change overnight. Your mind is going to take a little work, but your spirit can get right with God right here in this moment. And I'm telling you, it's a eternity defining decision to say, God, I'm giving you my heart, I'm giving control of my life over to you. And I think this is your moment right there at St. Pete, right there at Brandon, here at the South Tampa, the Heights, North Tampa. They're online. If that's you, on the count of three, I want you to make a bold decision. You're going to throw the hand up on the count of three and say, today's my day. I'm giving Jesus my life. I'm giving him my spirit. I want him to transform my mind. I want him to transform my body, but it's going to start with the inside. I want him to transform me. I'm giving him my sin, my past. I'm putting my control of my life in Jesus' hands. That's you on the count of three. Throw that hand up. One, two, three. Come on, all over this place. Thank you, thank you. Come on in the back. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Come on, there's more at every location. Come on, thank you. Thank you in the back there. I see your hands way back there. Thank you. Why don't we all pray this prayer together? Ready? Say, dear Jesus, today, I want you to transform me from the inside out. Thank you for dying on the cross so that I can live. Forgive my past, my present, and my future. And for the rest of my life, be my Lord and be my Savior. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody that believes it says, come on, let's celebrate life change that just happened.